It always takes a while for everybody to <laughs> sign on here. Oh, there's Woogie. Good evening from Florida. Hi. Bill Cooper. Great, great to see everyone. Hi, hi. Feliz Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> Okay. Well, I will uh, go ahead and call the meeting to order. Look at this. We have the gavel, yeah. the actual ESW gavel. Uh, welcome to the 1229th meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington today, May 5th, 2022. And I hope everyone is staying safe and uh, enjoying spring. You can hear me, I'm a bit nasal. Uh, I'm getting over COVID. <laughs> oh. but I'm doing fine now. Um, just, a, just a reminder uh, to keep yourselves muted. Um, and then if you wanna say something, just use the raise your hand icon. Also, um, we're recording this meeting and uh, this talk as well as many of the other ones that that we've had during um, time to COVID are available in our YouTube channel um, in NSOC Wash DC. And, and you can <clears throat> go and watch all of the previous meetings there. Um, if you don't want your, your video to show, um, you want to remain anonymous, just keep your video off and, and you should be able to, um, you won't appear on the video. So yeah, so great. So great to see a nice turnout and Al will let us know how many people showed up for this, for our, our, our meeting today. And we're very excited about our speaker, uh, Dr. Yvonne Linton and Al will be introducing her later on in the program. So um, we'll move on uh, with uh, Gary Hovell who will be reading and uh, then we will uh, approve the minutes. So Gary, you can take Thank you, Lord. The 1228th regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington convened by President Lourdes Chamorro at 7 p.m. on the 7th of April, 2022. 37 members and non-members attended the virtual meeting. The minutes of the March meeting were read by Recording Secretary Gary Hevel and were approved after a correction suggested by President-elect Matt Buffington. Matt asked that the name Asian Giant Hornet be used instead of Murder Hornet. Membership and Communication Secretary Elizabeth Young noted that Daniel Wilczek was a new applicant for membership and that Archie Kudis and Victoria Holland become members as of this evening. Program Chair Alan Norbaum announced that a new species of the fly Strausia has been recently discovered, reared from sunflowers. Kana Litwack shared an illustration that showed a Pompilid wasp in the genus Pepsis with a tarantula as prey. This illustration will soon be published. Alan Norbaum introduced the speaker of the evening, Miles Zhang whose presentation title was Advances in the Study of Gall Wasp Communities in the Genomic Age. Miles has recently worked with Mike Gates on rosebud galls. The family Cynipidae includes some 1,500 species worldwide and are mostly found on oaks in the Northern Hemisphere. The exact method used in making galls is not quite certain but the result is a change in the host plant tissues. There is much diversity in gall wasps and some produce nectar. Alfred Kinsey was an authority in the group collecting some 9 million specimens. His work on phylogeny was published in 1920. 
Lewis Welk has published on American doll watch. Recent collections from Texas have revealed a new species and will require further work there. The gull wasp deserves stronger attention and it is necessary to get more people into studies of the group. There was much discussion on the topic before adjournment of the meeting at 8.15 p.m. Thank you, um, Gary. I would just say, I think it was Al who made the correction of the name um, that that Matt Buffington would oppose the use of murder hornet. Yes, <laughs> Al, Al and Matt let me know for sure during the meeting, yes. <laughs> good, good. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the, the minutes and, and the second motion? So moved. Okay, and the second. Okay. I second. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so the minutes are approved. Thank you, Gary. And um, next, we will have reports of officers and committees. And um, I'll ask uh, President elect Mike Buffington to just quickly give us a, an update on our annual banquet. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Thank you, President Schmorrow. So we're set for June 9th. Um, the uh, rental contract has us with the time slot between four, uh, sorry, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. at Wood End Nature Reserve in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, lecture is scheduled for 1 p.m. by Jay Hosler, who's going to talk about the interface of um, scientific literacy, civil science, and art, and trying to promote scientific literacy through uh, comics and specifically with uh, entomological uh, themes. But since we have the place starting at 10, you know, we'll be setting up there probably right around then, but that's certainly no reason why not to show up and uh, maybe do some collecting, at least some exploring, some botanizing perhaps. And then, uh, you know, we can kind of relax afterwards too until, until 4 p.m. So that's the plan. I'm gonna be preparing a flyer here very shortly. I should have actually prior to this meeting, I apologize. But like Lourdes, I too had succumbed to COVID and uh, am kind of digging my way out of it. So um, we'll be uh, getting that flyer out real soon and uh, stay tuned. And just a, a minor um, correction, the, the banquet is the second, uh, Thursday, the second of June. It, is that correct, Matt? Uh, no, I'm just, I just reviewed the contract prior to this, uh, and it is the 9th, the 9th of June. Okay, okay, great. Thank you very much for that clarification. Okay, we hope to see everyone there, and we'll, we'll do our best to do as we did last year to um, have a hybrid uh, event where we'll have uh, the people who are there at the banquet, but then if anybody wants to join or resume, then we can do that as well. Okay, and uh, our next uh, item on the agenda is introduction of new members, uh, as well as any visitors. And um, Elizabeth Young, our membership and communication secretary, I do not see her. Um, at the meeting. So we may have to skip that part, uh, but if there are any visitors today, uh, please feel free to um, indicate uh, in the chat or just unmute yourselves and say hello. Okay. Well, it's always great to see the membership showing up. Um, next on the agenda is unfinished business. And we don't have any of that. Uh, any new business? Um, there isn't any either. And then um, we'll now move to presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. So if you have anything to show uh, the membership, or please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, show us what you have.
Okay, I think today we have a very <laughs> quiet group, um, but that's okay. Okay, so next uh, is a um, presentation of our, our topic and program chair Al Norbaum will introduce our featured speaker, uh, Yvonne uh, Linton. Hey, everybody. Um, tonight, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Yvonne Linton. Um, Dr. Linton was educated in Scotland, UK. She earned a bachelor's degree of science in zoology and environmental physiology in 1995 and her PhD in zoology from the University of Aberdeen in 1999. In 1998, she acquired a tenure position in mosquito systematics at the Natural History Museum in London, where she grew an active research team in molecular systematics and spearheaded the Global Mosquito Barcoding Initiative. In 2011, she came to the Walter Reed Biosystematics Unit for a sabbatical, loved it and never left. Dr. Linton now serves as research director for WRBU and co-holds a trust position with the Department of Entomology in the Smithsonian um, at the National, uh, National Museum of Natural History where she serves as head curator of the us &M Mosquito Collection, which comprises over 1.7 million specimens. She's authored over 100 peer-reviewed publication, uh, publications centered on integrated systematics, DNA taxonomy, phylogenetics, and vector incrimination of mosquitoes, ticks, and other vectors, as well as global biosurveillance and path pathogen detection studies. Her, her first book, Mosquitoes of the World, by uh, Richard Wilkerson, Yvonne Marie Linton, and Daniel Strickman was published by Johns Hopkins Press in January of uh, 2021. And tonight, her uh, topic is bugs, balloons, bats, and biosurveillance, which sounds very interesting. Uh, so Yvonne. Please uh, uh, welcome to uh, the ESW, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. I guess I have to unmute myself to say good evening to everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, as as mentioned, uh, my talk today uh, could probably include bipolar with uh, uh, topics such as uh, bugs, balloons, bats, and biosurveillance. And hopefully by the end of the talk, um, you'll see how it all comes together. So as um, Alan mentioned, I'm the research director of the Walter Reed Biosystematics Unit. That's actually um, a daughter or satellite uh, group of the, the entomology uh, department at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And actually just a, a couple of weeks ago, we realigned and we're now part of the One Health group. Uh, there too. So uh, we're housed within the Smithsonian, we're down at MSC, and uh, we don't get many visitors, but we'd be happy to, to have any of you down and, and take you on a little tour of our collection uh, down here whenever you're around. So a lot of people ask me, you know, what on earth is a military unit doing in the middle of, um, of entomology? And so really the, the historical entanglement of the military with, um, with the, the NMNH uh, really started um, in the 1960s, really with the tensions um, in Southeast Asia and the Pacific area um, just prior to the Vietnam War. And it was realized very quickly that the soldiers on the ground uh, were, were succumbing to uh, mosquito-borne diseases particularly, and these were causing um, more uh, wounds and, and injury to the soldiers than actually any of the combat wounds that were happening. So the military started to work very closely with the Smithsonian at that point, um, looking to see what were the vectors and what were the diseases that were transmitted. And in 1985, WRBU um, stood up as its own separate unit here within the Smithsonian. And um, from then we've been really tasked with looking at any diseases, um, particularly 
arthropod-borne diseases that are going to affect the soldiers in a global stage. So the relationship between the Smithsonian and, and the military has been incredibly fruitful. We've had some really, really good military entomologists that have come through the unit here, and it's led to many large scale taxonomic monographs and new species recognized throughout the world. So here we are um, in the Smithsonian. Uh, this is the, the Museum Support Center, and um, our offices are, are just under the WRBU uh, sign there. Um, this is uh, an image, um, a postage stamp of, of Walter Reed, um, who um, our unit is named after, and also some specimens from the collection where you can see in his own handwriting and signed um, by him in uh, 1900 are some of the legs of Aedes aegypti when it was um, recognized to, to be the primary vector of yellow fever. So um, we have some very nice historical records here in the collection, um, a lot of military history also connected through. Um, but our, our real role here is um, to, to prioritize the collection to grow the collection. And in 1965, when the military took over the collection, it was 200,000 specimens strong. Um, and now, as Lourdes mentioned, we have over uh, 1.7 million specimens. So our collections are, um, are built up of, of not only pinned collections, uh, we have the most geographically and taxonomically diverse collection in the world. Uh, very proud of that. We have over 65% of all known species of mosquito represented here. Um, and we have the largest collection of, of type specimens as well. Um, our collections, we do have some in ethanol, not, not too many, uh, but we have a lot of collections um, which are slide mounted. And often we have slide mounted associated specimens. So we have the larvae and pupae on a slide and then the, the associated the adult in the collection as well. So the collections here are incredibly valuable and um, we do have you know, up to 60 um, visitors every year that come through the collection. Um, WRBU is also responsible as part of our MOU, not only for the mosquito collection, but also eight other families. Um, and those include other biting flies, such as sand flies, horse flies, black flies, biting midges, um, and we also do uh, the non-biting collections as well. So um, one of the things I did want to show you was, um, was the, the book that we recently finished. It took eight years of blood, sweat and tears, I have to say, much longer than I ever anticipated when we agreed to do it. It turned from one book into two. And um, it was finally published um, in January 2021, where the FedEx man unceremoniously dumped this massive dump of, of paperwork on, on my front doorstep. Um, and I guess that that was the announcement that the book was out. So uh, Richard Wilkerson, myself and Dan Strickman, we've all been heads of the, um, the Walter Reed Biosystematics Unit. And um, it's really the collection um, and, and our love of it, our combined love of it, that, that drove us to writing this book. Um, the, as I said, it's two volumes. The, the images on the front um, are just beautiful photographs that were taken um, by our collaborator, Larry, as well. So he's, he's done some really beautiful pictures. Um, and we're happy to, to showcase his, his work on the front. Uh, Tyna Litwack also did um, all of the, the illustrations and plates inside with the help of, of Judith Stouffer, um, previous to, um, who worked on it previously. Um, so the, the book itself um, is, as I said, it's two volumes. The, the first part of, of volume one um, is a really in-depth look, almost um, a textbook, you could say, on the evolution, distribution, uh, development, dormancy, feeding, all different aspects of ecology um, of mosquitoes and a really deep dive that was really led by Dan Strickman. And then in the second part of the first volume, uh, we concentrate on species pages and genus pages, um, really looking in a lot of depth that, um, uh, this is moving on its own, sorry for this, <laughs> telling me I'm not going fast enough. Um, and then we also have um, 41 genus pages uh, defined in there, um, all, all genera of mosquitoes, um, and 127 uh, vector species pages, um, and a very extensive taxonomic glossary. 
In volume two, we basically, um, the whole of the volume two is an updated taxonomic catalogue of the world. And that's for all 3,700 taxa, as was um, defined at the time when, when we pushed go. There's obviously been a lot of, well, not a lot, but, but some changes since then. We have um, about another 12 species to add in there. Um, and each of the, the records for the taxonomic catalogue includes the authority, uh, where the name came from, the type locality information, depository information, all of the known synonyms, distributions, and all the taxonomic references, including where all of the illustrations are for every species in the world. Uh, we also did um, list out some informal species groups and the literature cited is there. So this is just an example really of um, one of the generic um, pages in the book. You can see that we um, work down the systematics and distribution of each of the genera, binomics, the associated pathogens we did by genus and also by individual species. And then we work through these diagnostic characters, which was something quite unique um, and a different way to look at the taxonomy. Um, we basically found the characters that if, um, if all of these characters were present, um, it could be nothing else. So rather than listing, you know, a lot of in-depth characters, we look for those unique characters. Um, this here is uh, Toxorhynchites. Um, it's one of the the genera of mosquitoes, and you can see by the curved proboscis there, that it doesn't feed as an adult, um, and it has um, predaceous larvae, which are used for biocontrol. We also, um, probably for one of the first times for the catalogue, um, we added DNA barcodes as well for representative species and a genitalia picture for all of them. And then you can see these illustrated um, slides which go along with the diagnostic characters uh, were there for each page. So then we moved um, to find 127 um, species that we knew were, were good vectors um, and that were important across the globe. So we did maps of the distribution of all of those. We did, uh, did a deep dive into the, the bionomics of each species, the associated pathogens, and again, picked out those diagnostic characters that were the most important. Um, this particular species is called um, Trichobosibon digitatum. And um, it has a, a really interesting biology in, in the fact that it actually um, guards its eggs. Um, it lays its eggs in, in small fruits that are on the floor, usually chomped by monkeys, and the, the rainwater gathers in there, and the mosquito um, will actually um, lay over the top of the eggs um, to stop the raindrops um, in the tropics from, from battering the, the eggs and washing them out. And as soon as the, the neonates appear from the eggs, um, they're able to dive down every time um, the water droplet hits them, so uh, they are not washed away. So we found some really nice things about mosquitoes on the way through this. Um, we This here on the left is the genus Malaya, and it has an interesting uh, symbiosis with, with ants. And you can see the proboscis there is a club shape. And what it actually does is um, it doesn't feed also on... Um, on blood as an adult, um, it actually uses that swollen palp uh, to drum against the palps of the, uh, uh, sorry, the swollen proboscis to, to drum against the palps of the ants, um, which then give just a small amount of, of nectar out. Um, and that's um, what the, the adult fly is then um, using for sustenance. So that's a kind of interesting, um, very tiny mosquito species. And then one of the most beautiful um, of all is the, the genus Sabathes. These are in the, the jungles of, of Latin America. You can see um, that they have these, these feathered um, legs, which are used in courtship. It's um, an unusual trait um, that mosquitoes actually have a courtship pattern, but, but here in the, the genus Sabathes, um, subgenus Sabathes, um, that's what these leg paddles are used for. And um, it's been shown that, that if these leg paddles are stripped bare um, in, the, in the males, they will still um, need to see those paddles in order for courtship to occur. And here we have um, on the left hand side here, one of the most um, archaic looking of all of the mosquito uh, genera, a very small genus Opifex, um, which is found in, in New Zealand and nowhere else. Um, the, this particular species, Opifex fuscus, in, is associated with seabirds, it feeds on seabirds, and you can see these, these spines that are there on the antennae. And when we were looking through this, I was wondering, you know, what exactly are those for? Um, could it be to protect their eyes as they go through the feathers of the, the birds? Um, 
And also, if we look at the ungies, um, you know, what on earth could they be using these claws for? And um, we looked carefully and we thought perhaps this is, you know, to, to get through the feathers. But in fact, um, it turns out that the genus Opifex, as, um, as an adult, um, the, the males will actually wait at the, the breeding sites uh, for the, the pupae to come to the surface. And if it's a few female pupae, they'll use these ungies to open up the, the pupil case and to mate with the female before she actually emerges. So um, it's a rather, rather quick trick, but um, obviously one that's worked for them. And the, the genus Udaya uh, fires eggs individually into small rot holes, which are caused by insect damage in bamboo. Um, and uh, then the, the larvae is able to, to rear up um, in, in this haven of uh, peaceful tranquility. But of course, the, the hole that it, it, um, the egg was fired into is very small. And so the mosquito is, is elongate. And you can see um, here the thorax and just how long that is in, in the genus Udaya. So again, a very small mosquito, but a pretty one. So. With all this diversity that we have in the collection, we tend just to look um, mainly at Anopheles, at um, Aedes and Culex. Um, these are the mosquitoes which are, are very famous for transmitting a lot of the, the biggest um, human pathogens. Um, but we, we've also been looking um, carefully at the, the collection itself. And um, we've, we published this paper in, in um, early 2021 um, that is showing that we were able to get not only um, small pieces of DNA, but whole, um, whole genomic DNA back from preserved specimens in the collection. So we were able to use the same um, methodology for mosquitoes and, and for kissing bugs, um, like going on the two extremes of the, the sizes that we were interested in. Um, and that was, was something that we were able to um, show an added value of um, mosquito collections. So we've been using DNA in collections for a long time. We've been trying to do barcodes. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, just depending on how the specimens have been preserved. But with the advent of next-gen sequencing, we can have very small pieces of, of DNA, which is usually what you have in these old specimens, and, um, and pull them together and get whole genomes back from them, just really underpinning the value of the collection and um, these new um, technologies and, and how these impact what we are able to do with collection specimens. So, so knowing that we were able to to get whole genomes back from the collection, we were able then to go through and um, look at some of the the groups that are less well known. Uh, we were able to use. Um, samples that were already available. There's not too many mosquito genomes available, surprisingly, um, about 37 species. And we were able to start making um, a primary phylogeny based on um, anchored hybrid um, enrichment, whole genomes that were available and transcriptomes that were available too. And just to see um, where um, all these superfamilies um, within the mosquitoes were, were actually related to each other. So the Kaeborids seem to be um, the outgroup that, that we had. Um, and uh, the, the subfamily Anopheline um, coming off very clearly from the subfamily, um, from the, the rest of the subfamily Culicini. So uh, if we can go to the next. Um, so I'm struggling a little bit with everybody's faces being over what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it keeps moving around. Um, so we were able to, to do some fossil cal calibrations um, through the tree, which was super helpful for us. And um, this work was actually done in collaboration with North Carolina State University um, with Brian Wegman down there and uh, John Sodigan. And we Sorry, let me go to the next one. One of the, the major findings that we, we came up with was that actually mosquitoes um, were, were on the earth when the dinosaurs were here, and that basically um, the, all of the radiation of the family of mosquitoes um, actually came from South America. So a lot of people uh, just assumed that, that all mosquitoes came from Africa, but in fact, our, our phylogeny shows very clearly that the, the root of um, all of today's mosquitoes certainly um, came from South America. So one of the, the interesting things that we found um, also was that, um, that 
the, the blood preferences um, of the, the mosquitoes um, that we have shows that, that we really had reptile feeding mosquitoes um, at the base of our modern phylogeny. So now we only have the genus Uranitania and some Culex species which are able to feed um, on reptiles, but um, historically all of the, um, the recent ancestors of the current mosquitoes were um, reptile feeders. So we In, in WRBU, um, as I said before, we are a military unit. So our work um, is not only on, on the, the systematics um, and identification of the mosquito species that, that or the, the vector species that we deal with. We also have um, the, the great privilege to have Rich Robbins, who I see on the call too, um, in WRBU helping us with our, our tick species identifications and and here we just have a slide to indicate just the, the places in the world that we're actively working at this moment in time, um, helping the, the military that is um, not only the army, but the, the Air Force and the, the Navy with all of their identifications and biosurveillance efforts um, across the world. So we really like to say at WRBU that we provide entomological intelligence. It's a little tongue in cheek dig at our military colleagues, but um, but we we do um, provide taxonomic keys um, that are, are really primarily for use um, by military or parataxonomists. Um, we provide vector hazard reports and spotlight reports on um, new species that are found um, incursing into new areas. Uh, we we have um, this this tri map that, that we use. We say that we need the identification of the species, the biology of the species, and the distribution in order to work out what the hazard is um, to soldiers on the ground at any one point. So we also at WRBU we have um, the the vector map team. Um, vector map has been around now for about ten years, and we have the largest uh, curated collection of, of data points for any of the vectors um, in the world. Uh, there, we're actually this year we're going to celebrate our millionth record. So um, each one of those has been data checked and validated. Um, a lot of them are, are associated and have either e-vouchers or physical vouchers. A lot of them come from our collection. Uh, when the Zika outbreak happened, we were able to very quickly um, go into the collection upstairs, combine it with what we already had in VectorMap, and produce the largest database that was known for, um, for the vectors of, of Zika um, and do some predictive modeling from there. Uh, we provide a lot of these vector hazard reports based on countries, based on species for the military. Um, and these are all available on the WRBU website, which is just wrbu.si.edu. So um, just now, um, there's a, a, obviously a huge um, problem um, in Eastern Europe. And um, for several years now, we've been looking at the, the problem of tick-borne encephalitis virus in Europe. Um, with the idea that the military uh, from US are, are present um, in good numbers in Europe. And although within Europe for the longest time there's been available vaccines for tick-borne encephalitis virus, these were never FDA approved. And so therefore they could not be given um, to soldiers who were doing some exercises um, in Eastern Europe. And you can see that the, the um, incidence of TBE is very patchy. And so we were, we were tasked with understanding whether it was important enough um, of a disease and, and with enough um, coverage to, to warrant doing an FDA approval um, for the military. So we know that, um, that TBEV can cause fatal encephalitis, um, but there's three different subtypes. And depending on the subtype and the vector involved, uh, depends on whether you have a less than 1% chance of dying or, or a one in three chance of dying. And the Far Eastern subtype, which is found in Eastern Russia, uh, China and Japan, um, is, is um, primarily transmitted by Exodes prosocatus, which is the, the tiger tick found up in, in those very cold um, Eastern steppe um, type environments. Um, Exodes racinus is the, the vector which is super common all over Europe. Um, and um, in Central Europe, um, even in, in Scotland, where I'm from, um, that's the, the common sheep tick. So um, we were 
test um, with, with looking to see where cases of TBEV were found. And, and the pink map on the left hand side shows you where the, where the uh, viruses um, and people with cases of TBEV were found. Um, and on the, the green just underneath, it's probably a map that not too many of you see. And that's, that's where US soldiers are actually stationed in Europe. So uh, you can see that there are all but two countries that um, have military presence in Europe. So we were able to to look at the, the tick surveillance data for the TB vectors in Europe, and we were able to overlay this um, on some positive TBV cases. And you can see that um, around the Balkan areas um, is the areas of highest risk. We were then able to take um, Maxent models um, and look at, at suitable habitat um, for the Rhesinus tick um, in Europe, which is is the most common one. But you can see that the um, the distribution um, with the Maxent is uh, shows that there are areas um, of higher risk than others. And we were able to ascertain that that in the the region of Ukraine um, that this was a particularly important uh, risk. Uh, for them there. Uh, we looked in Latvia, we looked in Poland, we did some uh, screening of the ticks that were there. Um, not too many. Uh, we took ventral and dorsal photographs or e-vouchers for all of these and we did DNA um, RNA extractions. We, of the 179 ticks that we collected, we found only one positive. Uh, but one of the things that we did find um, was that all of these other pathogens were present. And um, this was actually quite shocking uh, for us to to determine that that um, so many pathogens were were present, and we were able to report back to the military that that tick-borne diseases in general and not just TBV were of importance um, in this area, and um, and that that the use of, of treated uniforms um, was critical to any of the soldiers that were actually deployed in this area. Um, since the reports that we've done. Um, the, the FDA has actually approved the use of, of TBEV uh, vaccines here for, for the troops and um, all of the soldiers who will be deployed to, um, to uh, the, the region where Ukraine is will be protected as a result. So uh, this is a, a project where the balloons come in. Um, we have a great collaboration with Tovi Lehman and his group um, out of NIH. Uh, this publication, uh, actually the illustration here is Tina Litwack's illustration and Lourdes was part of the team who was working on the IDs um, of, of the samples that were collected on helium balloons um, with, with sticky nets trapping um, long distance migration of, of insects across the Sahel in um, actually originally in Mali, these, these samples were taken. So um, Tovi Lehman is one of the most interesting people I think I've ever met. He's, his brain is amazing and works in a completely different way to mine. And, and he's always thinking outside the box. And his, his question stemmed around uh, the mosquitoes um, that were present in the Malayan um, Sahal why malaria just suddenly disappeared um, at different times of the year when, when the when it started to, to dry out and there was no visible water uh, present. Uh, where did the mosquitoes go? And he spent a lot of his career looking to see if they were estivating. And actually what our study was able to show was that, that the mosquitoes and particularly um, as well the Anopheles, uh, which was his interest, were, were actually deliberately taking long distance migrations to avoid um, the, the conditions that were unfavorable um, in the ground below. So one of the things that, that we did in this paper was we were able to, to focus in um, mainly on the Anopheles vectors. We identified the vectors using DNA barcodes, so we were able to say exactly which species were found, and they included the major vectors in the Anopheles Gambier complex. One of the most interesting things for me, um, as soon as I saw the specimens, was that most of the specimens that we looked at were actually gravid. And that meant that, that the mosquitoes only, you know, 36 hours or less um, earlier, were actually taking blood meals on the ground, almost packing their suitcase, if you liked, for this long journey ahead of them. That meant that not only did they have the sustenance um, and the fluid uh, to survive this, this long journey, uh, which we showed could be up to 350 uh, kilometers, 
Um, but they also um, were potentially able to, to land in that new destination um, already with their eggs ready to, to um, be laid um, and the next generation carry on. So we did do some studies. Um, we did head thorax um, and we looked for, for plasmodium in the samples. We were not able to find plasmodium in the few um, mosquitoes that we had, but we did. We were able to show that the mosquitoes had fed on human blood, which means that we do have the potential for the for a transmission um, of human bloodborne pathogens like malaria. Um, we're also working um, together. We, we published another paper, um, again with Lourdes, um, and this was actually showing just the, the magnitude um, of the, the different species that were um, found in these um, you know, balloon collections that, that were done. They were collected up to 250 meters um, above the ground level. So um, there was over 100 species from 13 insect orders that were found on the sticky uh, traps and the balloons. Um, and we, we showed that actually the density of, of what was found on, on each one of these sticky traps was really climate driven. So it was the, the desertification of the environment that was pushing the mosquitoes um, and other insects to move so this then we realized had a much bigger impact um, on environmental health because um, potentially not only do you have the human pathogens moving, you also have the movement of, of animal and plant viruses, which can affect food security, particularly in this part, area of the world. So um, we are now uh, actually just finishing some next gen sequencing now that we're back into the office um, for the, the mosquitoes that we have found up in um, in the, the collections, and we're looking to see if we can detect any viral pathogens as well. So the other kinds of things that, that we're involved in um, is the movement and incursion of, of new species um, uh, as they establish around the globe, particularly obviously vectors is what we're interested in. Um, here we published the incursion of, of an old world um, mosquito, um, Aedes vitatus. Um, it's another black and white stripy legged mosquito. Um, to to the, the untrained eye, most commonly just called Egypti, called Albopictus, and never really looked at. But you can see that it has this beautiful six spotted pattern down, down the back of the thorax. So very, very recognizable if you know um, what it is that you're looking for. And um, we have biosurveillance stations across the globe. And one of the stations that, that we found this mosquito in, in the very first instance was Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. So a bit of an unusual place to do your field collections, but um, one bird bath um, in the in the soldiers' uh, quarters was found uh, with what was assumed to be um, Egypti, and it was actually found um, that this was was Vitatus. We were able to do the DNA barcodes and compare the samples that we we found in Cuba. Um, and you can see at the bottom there in orange where, where our Cuban samples fall out. Um, and we were able to show that, that there was actually some other specimens that came into GenBank at the same time as ours did from the Dominican Republic. Um, and we were able to show that there was two separate introductions um, into the, the Caribbean region um, and establishment of these populations. Um, despite the fact that these mosquitoes were not from Latin America, they were actually um, from Asia. And, and in particular, our Cuban samples were from the Pakistan and Northern Indian um, area. So uh, we were able not only to say that, you know, with the barcodes that this was truly this, this new species that we'd found, but also give some kind of indication of where it came from. Uh, the fact that it was introduced, you know, it was already in, in Dominican Republic as well as Cuba, and these findings came out more or less at the same time. Um, we were able to say, um, you know, that this was this was a most likely a shipping route um, introduction of the mosquitoes. This particular mosquito is a supersonic vector of of Zika, of chikungunya, and of dengue. And so the question still remains: How long was that there? Is this uh, a mosquito species that's actually been one of the driving factors of the, the Zika outbreak um, and has just been quietly hiding in plain view for some time? So we're still working on working out just how far spread this mosquito actually is. 
So our work, um, obviously within the pandemic, um, there has been a lot of interest in bats, in, in ectoparasites of bats, um, in ticks of wildlife species in general. And we have, with the help of, of Rich Robbins, turned our face a little towards the, the, the tick um, aspect more than the mosquitoes, which we've been more, more um, commonly known for doing in WRBU. Um, and so just very briefly, we've been working in Kenya a lot. Uh, we've been doing some bat swabs in Kenya, uh, looking at rectal and oral um, swabs. Uh, we actually did a documentary um, for Vice. They have a, um, a documentary series called Hunters, and you can actually find that on the, on the YouTube. Um, if you just write in, in um, virus hunters, you, it will come up. Um, so at WRBU and RARE, we did some Illumina sequencing um, on the NovaSeq, and we were able to do some metagenomic analysis on the swabs from these bats. And um, we, this is basically with 54 bats, uh, what we came up with. Uh, we, we found in three different caves in Kenya, um, eight species of bats. And one of those at the bottom there, Optimus harrisoni, has just been described as a, a new species separated from Matasoni um, in 2015. And you can see there that we have 12 um, coronavirus hits uh, for our bats. And of course, um, in the current climate, we're very interested in coronaviruses. And um, so we've drilled down a bit more into looking at those. We just have 12 uh, positives and 22 samples of that particular species. Um, these are from the Suswa cave. It's two hours away from Nairobi. Um, it's a very popular cave for tourists. Um, it's, it, it has very strange like um, volcanic larval tube caves. Um, and each one um, of these tubes has a different colony of this bat. And the bat is supernumerary. Um, it, it has um, like 15,000 in a colony is, is not uncommon. So, so basically here we have um, with our next gen sequencing data, we have um, a couple of, of areas of the genome which, which we've got more coverage than others. And uh, what we've actually been able to show is that in that particular um, species of um, bat, we have not one new virus, but actually a novel group of alpha coronaviruses. So these are alpha coronaviruses are um, viruses of bats primarily. Um, you can see uh, down at the bottom here is our, car, uh, our SARS um, CoV-2. Uh, so our COVID uh, sample, uh, the first one to be isolated there from Wuhan, but but this is um, you know a little bit distinct and different from that. Uh, we're looking just now at the spike protein to see if there's any chance that that this these new group of viruses um, could potentially infect um, humans or or other close relatives of humans, and uh, that work is is underway just now. But um, what you can see here with the numbers one thousand, two thousand, three thousand these are indicative of different um, colonies within these caves. So different tubes different larval tubes. And what we're able to see here is that we have different strains of the, the virus, different um, groups of virus within um, each of these cave systems. So that's super interesting and, and a big kind of hit for us. Um, we're working more and more in Kenya. We work with the Impala uh, Wildlife Research Center. Um, that's that's a, um, a research center which uh, Smithsonian is, is one of the trustees for. Um, and we were basically working on the premise that there is more likely to be um, spillover where we find animals, um, wildlife and uh, domestic animals in great numbers looking at common resource. So we have a new project that was funded last year. It's a congressional special interest project. Um, it's called the, the ReadyNet, Remote Emerging Disease Intelligence Network. And we secured with University of Notre Dame and um, the Naval Medical Research Center, we secured $5 million uh, last year and $5 million this year um, to, to continue our, our work 
developing a pipeline um, system for, for looking at uh, water, pathogens in water using metagenomics. Um, also, as you can see in the um, around about the watering hole, there's this very muddy area where the animals defecate and, and urinate as they're, as they're drinking the water. And we're taking soil samples from those um, places. And we're also looking at um, tick drags from around the areas of the watering hole, particularly those areas where the animals are, are most frequently using the, the paths. Um, and we're also looking at leeches inside the watering holes as blood bags. So um, we have done some work on, on wildlife ticks. Uh, we just submitted the, the paper last week, actually, um, looking at various different wildlife animals that were you know, incidentally darted by the, the Kenyan Wildlife Services um, as they've gone around and done their, their um, monitoring of the wild animals. And so any animals that were sick, um, they usually get darted and swabs taken or, or medicine given. Um, and if there was any ticks on them, they took them and we were able to do some next gen sequencing with the ticks. Um, and the, there's some super interesting things that are, are found in those ticks. Um, and not to, to labor on those, but uh, we, we looked at different ticks that were taken from, from large ungulates, things like rhinos and, and elephants. We looked at ticks that were taken from domestic um, animals that are in this environment. In the environments um, in Kenya like this, the, the domestic animals and the wildlife animals, there's no, there's no ranch gates or fences. The animals are all intermingled. Um, so there's a high chance of, of you know, spillover of any pathogens that, that are in the environment. Um, and so we looked at the domestic animals. We looked at, um, at the ungulates all different species. Um, we had lions and cheetahs and leopards and, and wild dogs, ticks taken off of those animals. And, and although one would assume that because the carnivores are, are eating meat and, and there, there seems to be, you know, more, more um, ways for other pathogens to go into the carnivores, actually the most interesting data that we found was from these large um, ungulates. And um, within the bloods of the that were the blood meal in the ticks on the elephants and these other large animals, we were able to see waterborne pathogens. So things like schistosoma mansoni was found in the blood in the tick um, on these elephants. And we, we were also able to see um, and to detect the, the flesh eating um, amoeba that was just described in Kenya in, in um, 2014. So we're very confident that our next gen sequencing uh, processes are working well. Um, we have this biosurveillance and xenosurveillance approach. So biosurveillance, looking at the ticks that are, are there, looking at the leeches that are there, and the xenosurveillance, looking at the environment. And so we're more and more aware that we can't look at these things independently, um, much as we would love to, to you know, just keep working on the mosquitoes and on the ticks um, and all the findings that we have. The, the interesting, um, aspect really comes with the carrying capacity what what is normal for these different environments what what should we expect to find and when do we know that we're close to a spillover event so when is it that that our um ecosystem is out of whack and we are liable to see um, a spillover event happen and where are those going to come from which animals are they going to come from so the first um, phase of, of our ReadyNet project is is coming to an end um, we've developed a lot of SOPs um, collection SOPs for for all four uh, different types um, of samples that we have there we have an, an emerge pipeline which is um, based on the cloud um, to, to pull data Data up from MinION and um, and MiniSeq um, sequencing platforms, and to to put those through an automated um, pipeline for for the analysis of of the next generation sequencing data that we have, and and bring forth an alert dashboard. Uh, we also um, wrote a paper um, that was just published um, in May last year and really starting to advocate for an ecosystem model um, towards um, working out exactly which parameters may be um, the cause for, for the spillovers that we're seeing. Um, we know that these spillovers happen. We're, we're really monitoring um, in different environments we have 
we have our, our first step um, with the ReadyNet project was to look in Kenya, Belize, and in Florida. And in this next round, we're going to be expanding um, the types of samples that we looked at to opportunistic vertebrate samples. But we're really looking at, um, on an environmental level now, what is it that um, is, is happening within the ecosystems to, um, to make the prediction of a pandemic and the containment of a pandemic um, more feasible and and more well better understood so that we can predict and prevent the next pandemic so that was a lot of different things bugs and balloons and biosurveillance um, we we have updated our website very recently, we have very nice um, images and, and a lot of detailed data um, on mosquitoes um, on our website. We have the vector map site as well. So if anybody is interested in, in mapping or modeling um, vector-borne disease, um, we would love to collaborate, love to, to hear what it is that, that you're all doing. And um, thank you for listening tonight. Well, thanks, Yvonne. That was really interesting. Um, I just want to remind everybody, if, if you have a, a question, if you use that um, raise your hand uh, symbol under the reactions down at the bottom of the Zoom screen, it's an easy way to um, see that you have a question. I think Lourdes has a question. Um, uh, Matt has a question. I was clapping. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Hi, hi! Thank you. That was a, a truly inspiring talk. It's so, so, so fantastic. Just such cool stuff. Um, one of the one of the questions that came to mind: a lot of your, a lot of the work that you're doing is based on barcode data. Mm -hmm. um, how have you, <clears throat> within the mosquito research community, maintained uh, quality control over? applying taxonomic names and concepts to a barcode? That's a very good question. And um, the, the reality is that it works um, really, really well in some groups and not so well in others. And uh, what we've tried to do as a community is, is stabilize the nomenclature. Um, that we have. Uh, we've actually just recently um, in Anopheles um, entered into a project with the Sanger Center, which is um, actually looking at, at 58 markers across the genome, um, which they are using to, to definitively determine um, different species within Anopheles, and then they're going to move out wider. Um, the community as a whole, we've, we've all worked for such a long time doing CO1 barcodes. We know that you know, in some cases we have to use ITS2, and in some cases that's still not quite telling us what we need to know. Um, so as a community, we've, you know, all of us have come together and said, we need to do CO1 and ITS2, as well as this new method for, for the genomics. Um, one of the things that, that's very obvious when you start doing a lot of, of um, the metagenomics approaches and the next gen approaches is that you don't always get the barcode region. You know, So you're left still with this question mark of how, how is it that we know what we have? Um, so we are trying to, to marry all that data up. We're trying to use, um, the, the biological identification numbers in, in bold as, as ways to, to hang a species on. So rather than saying, this is my species one and this is his species A, let's just try and, and use you know, more of a, um, a standardized approach until we know better, you know, just so that everybody can use the same language. And it, yeah, it's one of those things that's always gonna have problems, but I, I do think that this, um, you know, multiple gene approach, this GWAS approach, um, does seem to be very powerful and it relies on a very small fragment um, of, of the genome in each of these places. Um, the, the cost per sample per ID um, is, is leagues less than what we're paying currently for, for the individual barcodes. And the individual barcoding, as, as you know, as we go through and there's less and less classical taxonomists, becomes what people pin all of their results on. Um, 
and an awful lot of people are not keeping up with the literature they're, they're not understanding that this is actually a new species and this is different and it's it's actually clouding a lot of the work um, particularly the pathogen association work that we're doing just now so that's the way that the mosquito people are are going um i'll be interested to hear how very very similar to kind of how how we're doing it and i mean my work is obviously in biocontrol um agents um, but it's we're trying to do it at the community level, bring, bring, you know, try to infuse taxonomy in, in people's uh, research groups that normally they don't want to deal with systematics. They don't want to deal with names and, and I get it, but so it sounds like we're, we're further, further behind than y'all, but I, it, it's good to hear we're on the right. It sounds like we're on the right track. We're doing something kind of similar, but in, uh, in, in infant type stage right now. I think it's encouraging that, you know, the, the collections are, are really coming into their own, even even very old specimens in the collections where we're able to get whole genomes for which I mean, who would have ever thought that, you know, that's incredible. And um, the Sanger have worked very hard with um, particularly with the Natural History Museum in London to to work out a, a process where they can actually take mosquitoes that are on pins and minimally, um, you know, cause any damage really literally no damage to the specimens even though they're on the pins um and they just you know are dunking the specimens uh most of the the scales are staying you know everything that we are fearful of to the point that nhm uh in london are agreeing for the types to be used you know so that's huge so we're going to test out that that on some in case my boss is on i'm not doing on the types <laughs> Not doing on the types, but we will test out some of our um, specimens, photograph them before and after, and just see that we're completely comfortable with that. You are being recorded. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. That's my caveat. <laughs> Al has a question. Yeah, um, well, I just had a comment. Uh, first of all, I um, enjoyed your uh, article. Was it Something in the Smithsonian about the elephant fly. Yeah, <laughs> a couple months ago, and uh, yeah, I remember as a grad student, like seeing a Tuxorynchites and thinking, "Wow, that's a mosquito. It can be that big or that beautiful." And, and that's the gen I mean, gentle giant. I always call it of the mosquito world. You know, people see that and they're like, "That's the one that bit me. That's definitely the one." Yeah, sure. <laughs> huge, you know. Um, but but they don't bite as adults and they're they're used as biological control in, in the rice fields and in, in Southeast Asia. Um, but I, I do remember as a as a rookie mosquito collector, you know, having one of these giant um, larvae in, in my bag with everything else that I'd collected and then waking up the next day to find nothing, just this big fat guy. Uh, and I was super happy that I'd given him his breakfast. So, yeah, I never made that mistake again, but it was, it was definitely a learning curve. But I was amazed at just how many larvae they could consume. Um, and then obviously with the, the proteins all, all being embalmed at the, the larval stage, they, they don't need to take blood as the adults to mature their eggs. So, so uh, yeah, they're not biting as adults. I was just curious, like, um, how well do you think the mosquito fauna, you know, is known? Um, it's obviously one of the best studied families of flies, but are you still finding a lot of new ones or is it kind of reached the towards the top of the I, I think we're we're still, we're still very much in in the infancy of, of what we're going to find I think you know the 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 groups that have really been worked on well is is really just three genera um and I know from my own studies that I have at least um 50 new species of Anopheles that need to be formally described um and there's a formal description of 470. So, so every group that we we work on, um, particularly with the with the approaches that we've taken, we always um, with our whole genomes or or with the barcoding, we get the the nominotypical members um, of that that species. You know, so as near to the type locality as we can, and then we use that to to pin the ID of of sensu stricto and anything else that we find with the same name, or you know that comes out the similar in keys. Then we start to accumulate those as species complex members. Um, we have found in every group that we've worked in um, where, where we think we have every group member we have at least 17 percent more 
than, than what we thought we had to start with, which is why this barcoding is never finishing. I'm going to finish my life before it's ever done. <laughs> I keep saying, you know, we, we just randomly said that we would pull out 80% of all known mosquitoes and it's just never going to happen. So, um, but it, but it is a very powerful tool, I have to say. It has, has made us very aware of keeping e-vouchers and just how important that is. Um, and that's really something that's coming into its own, especially when we're you know, doing a lot of destructive um, sampling and looking for pathogens and, and uh, trying to work out um, networks of, of what these mosquitoes um, and ticks may be feeding on. So we did um, just release a new layer that people might be interested in in VectorMap, which is called Blood Meal Map. And looking through the literature for um, molecularly identified blood meals, um, we were able to associate those with um, with the the mosquito species um, that that they're they're feeding on. So that if we find a new pathogen, we'll be able to work out just how far through the, the food web that, that will actually go. And um, if we find a pathogen in a bird, which of the mosquitoes in this area may may feed on that and, and uh, work out just where the risk lies there. So that's a, an interesting COVID uh, product, but uh, quite a nice one. I think Jill and Warren have a question. Yes. Hi, Yvonne. Uh, Hi. This is a really interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could you comment on Zika? <laughs> because when I worked at the National Park Service in 2016, it was like this nightmare. And then I retired in 2017 and I'm like, Where, what happened? It, it just um, vanished. <laughs> It vanished off um, off everybody's radar, but it um, but it's far from gone. Um, there's still, um, you know, certainly in in Brazil, there's a lot of, of uh, children still being born with microcephaly. Um, we we have cases of, of Zika, um, you know, that come out all the time. Um, Caribbean has some cases, um, you know, the. the the importance of it hasn't changed at all. Um, it's just the deflection of, you know, what's happening now versus what what um, what is going on elsewhere. And yeah. and really, with with COVID, I think you know, 15 million people worldwide dying. That's rolled our our Zika off there. But you know, one of the things with Zika was that because we had already been collecting all this data with the the vector map for 10 years and the, the huge collection that we had upstairs, we were actually, the data that we had was what was used by CDC to, to do all the predictions. Um, so that just shows, you know, the value of collections and really being on top of those collections. Um, we were also able, you know, there was a knee jerk reaction to, we have to find, um, and this was the military knee jerk reaction, we have to collect all the AEDs we can find, we have to screen every single one of them, we have to like send people out every week of the year and, and go collecting. And we were able to, to show with our models that um, although the, the mosquito might be active at 13 degrees, the Zika virus itself was not able to reproduce until it was 19 degrees in the ambient temperature. So we, we made, um, a, a, an interactive map for all of the, the military bases across USA and, and in the South America to say, if, if you have all these different combinations, today you have to go and sample, you know? And we were able to show that it was really just um, three species or so we thought at that time, um, Albopictus, um, Egypti and um, Gymnovitatus. But now of course we found Aedes potatoes hiding there in the Caribbean. And that, that for me, I think it has a big role in what happened there. Um, I think that the, the propagation of, of the virus, the, the ability for the virus to, to replicate to, to the level that it needed to, to have all of these people infected. Um, we're, we're looking at uh, vectors that are able to, to have trans ovarian transmission of the virus. You know, that means that, that the mother is infected, so all of her eggs are infected. And, and so you're really looking at 100, 120 eggs per, per ovi cycle, but, you know, five or eight or 10 ovi cycles for the lifetime of that female, depending on the weather and how hot it is, you know. So, so that could be up to 800, 900 infected individuals um, from one mosquito. So um, I think that we do still have a lot of lessons to learn from Zika. I think it's a, a very hard hit that's been taken in Latin America in particular. Um, but we, what we do know is that our biosurveillance 
is working. We are finding these new species. We are still monitoring. We're still um, screening for pathogens. We're starting now to screen for pathogens that we don't know, as well as those that we do, um, using more of a, a holistic approach with next generation sequencing. And although that brings a lot of complications to us and, you know, a whole new skill set of our bioinformatics uh, learning curve, but um, it's definitely productive and, and we're, we're learning a lot. So it's an interesting place to be just now. On the All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I could ask you another question if nobody else has a, a, another one. Um, you mentioned your phylogeny about uh, you know reptile feeding being mm. at the base. Like so, can you speculate whether mosquitoes uh, fed on dinosaurs? And you're also talking about cold-blooded versus warm-blooded. Like, isn't there like uh, some discussion about whether dinosaurs could have been warm-blooded? Would that have any? It's like that. I'm going to say is definitely out of my wheel bag. But um, but we have been working very closely with um, University of um, North Carolina State University, um, and the all of the data goes goes back to show that the the relatives of the recent radiation of mosquitoes um, were definitely you know in that same era from the dinosaurs. Um, they were <laughs> feeding. Um, Definitely reptile, reptilian feeding, whether the warm blood, cold blood, I honestly don't know that I can answer that properly. I would, I would love John Sodigan to be here and I can definitely get his take on that and, and let you know. Uh, but the base of, of the phylogeny is, is within that, that uh, group with, with the Uranitania. Um, so our theory is that, that it was cold-blooded and that we that we now um later within the the lineage um adapted to to warm-blooded we can see in some of the the tips of the trees that um we can see where where the mosquitoes have been um simian feeders and then moved to to human feeders particularly in in areas of southeast asia where we have you know the the very first of the the humanoids um emerging at the same time so we have some some deeper phylogenetic signals and some some more recent ones but john's real um take home is that that um all of the the modern day mosquitoes were were um reptilian feeders some some feed on birds too right is that secondary yeah. thing or like that seems to be secondary yeah yeah, yeah. you were uh, you were talking about coronaviruses like are you afraid uh, Rand Paul's going to come up with some kind of conspiracy theory that you're doing something <laughs> you shouldn't be doing well one of one of my colleagues was um was earmarked on a on one of the, the, the Russian propaganda sites as, as somebody who was doing very strange things and named, you know, which is a bit oh, alarming. No. Um, but, um, you know, we, we are just examining what's there, you know, um, and to the best of our ability, putting out there whether we think that it's important or not important. I think what's important is that we're finding whole new groups of things that we didn't know were out there, you know, and, yeah. and now, especially with the knowledge that we have from coronavirus um, outbreaks, you know, being able to, to know which proteins to look at to see, you know, um, whether, whether we think that that's going to be something that will affect humans, I think. The, the more people know and understand about these viruses, the more we'll be able to predict their, their impact. Um, I, I think it's very interesting that you have so many different viruses in animals that are living right next door to each other, but they just don't interact, you know, that, that you can have this, this ecological separation, um, even within the same geography. Sorry, my dog uh, was barking there. <laughs> um, well, any, if anybody has any, anybody, anybody else have questions you'd like to ask? And just to comment that it was a great talk. You must be so busy with this $5 million grants back to back and all the work that you've been doing. And thank you so much for your service and all that you do. It's amazing what you've been able to do with, with the collection and the data that you've been able to generate. Um, it's great. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much for for joining us thank you very much for inviting me <laughs> yeah
Can I just say, say something? You, um, you obviously are very smart and it's comforting to know that people like you are working on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very sweet of you to say i don't feel very smart a lot of the days <laughs> yeah, <I know> <laughs> great great well with um with that uh, uh yes thank you very much and thank you al again for for such a, a great program that we've had this spring um you are indeed uh, our last uh speaker for for this uh, season and uh, for our next meeting, it's our annual banquet, like we said before, uh, Matt Buffington was talking about. Um, so yes, yeah, so stay tuned for that. There'll be more <clears throat> uh, information coming to you about that. And um, yeah, so um, I think we'll move on to to adjourn. Do, do I get a do you have a motion to to adjourn meeting? A motion. Okay, a second. Second. Okay, and uh, I adjourn the meeting with my new gavel. awesome gavel. <laughs> I forgot to show it, actually. This is the official gavel. <laughs> I finally got it. So. Now, that, <laughs> now that you have that, is Matt behaving? <laughs> he's, he's always behaving. <laughs> but it has a cool box, too. <laughs> I forgot to show it. It actually has some bark beetle a uh, piece of wood. Oh, you can't quite see it because of the, mm -hmm. yeah. but anyway, I'll show it at the next meeting for the show and tell. <laughs> yeah, I think, Ron, uh, I think Ron did that box, didn't he? Didn't he? Uh, that was Nick Blanton, who is our instrument builder from Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Yeah. And he oh, found wow. that piece of hackberry that was riddled by the Sarambicids, and he reared a, a buprested out of it. That was in a little box inside the box that has some label, but I don't know, that may have been lost by now. Oh, yeah, maybe that got lost. It was a Texania, pretty big beauty. So, Gary, you're going to have to adjust this section to the show and tell presentation <laughs> exhibit. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> got many claims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Maybe. That's a cool story. I didn't know that one. Great. Well, thank you everyone for, for showing up. This was great. Nice to see everyone. Please stay safe. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Yeah, I, I had to say earlier too that we had, uh, I think, 24 participants tonight. I don't know if Gary or anybody is recording that. A nice turnout. Great meeting. Thank you again, Yvonne. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.